very going from ortho tv anyway today we are going to do a basic neuroscopy of the orthopedic organization now i request our secretary madhusudan sir to start the webinar respected president sir bihar orthopedic association dr asin saraf sir uh, all the speakers all the panelists moderator and all the boa members and ortho tv especially dr samsul hoda the convener of it boa it is my privilege to welcome you all in this webinar topic is arthroscopy arthroscopy really the arthroscopy is the need of our for every orthopedic surgeon each and every orthopedic surgeon it is the need of our new uh, talk hai by dr sajan ma i believe it will be turn to be a beneficial session beneficial webinar for all the orthopedic surgeon especially the blooming young orthopedic surgeon of our association so thanks i request dr sarab sir the president of our association to say few words hello good evening to you all on behalf of boa i welcome you all actually most surgeon in developed countries know how to do diagnostic arthroscopy however same is not in developing countries due to lack of training or number of cases are less i think this program will help or this webinar will help them to know the tips and tricks of arthroscopic surgery welcome to you all and thank you and i hand over the uh, to our moderator manish kumar and uh, and abhishek yes good evening everyone thank you sir uh, you see the situation is such in bihar we are losing many fraternities of our own association which is really very painful and amidst this situation uh we really like to meet each other in a group but that's not getting possible network so is this is one way where we really it's our honest need that my audible yeah sir but network is breaking actually like your voice is not very clear video off kar dijiye manish ji to thoda awaaz clear ho jayega बैंड ज्यादा ले रहा होगा वीडियो में इंटरनेट का प्रॉब्लम है बेस तो वीडियो ऑफ करने से थोड़ा बैंड भी बढ़ जाएगा ओके राइट अपर कॉर्नर से वीडियो ऑफ हो जाएगा राइट आई यस आई थिंक इफ माय नेटवर्क इज नॉट वेरी क्लियर डॉक्टर सरफ दैट डॉक्टर अभिषेक इफ यू यू कैन स्टार्ट द सेशन आई आई फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वेलकम एंड आई थैंक्स बी आर Kirtan. hello uh, i thanks bihar orthopedics association for conducting such a useful webinar on basic arthroscopy as told by our secretary respected secretary madhusudan sir it's need of an hour and more or less like uh, at least all orthopedic surgeons should know the basic diagnostic arthroscopy and that's why our president sir dr asen sir ab sir has kept the theme basic arthroscopy course so uh, i welcome all our star faculties dr rakesh swadhi sir dr arvind sir dr rajiv anand sir as well as i welcome all the moderators as well as, uh, as, well as uh, all our panelists and with this we will start our session with dr rakesh chaudhary sir and he will be talking on patient position and he will be describing basic things about the arthroscopic instruments and equipments Uh, so that we can get you know like uh, get to know that like what are the basic tools which we start uh, from where we can start our arthroscopy so rakesh choudhary uh, rakesh choudhary sir we can start our session with you sir uh, thank you abhishek i will just share my screen and then we'll start
Uh, right. Uh, good evening, all of you, respected President Sir. Uh, hope I am audible to you all clearly. Uh, Mr. Secretary and all of you. Uh, to begin with, uh, first, uh, let uh, my condolence be there for one of our uh, very respected member, Dr. Arvind Kumar, uh, lost his uh, fight against Corona today. And uh, personally, it is a great loss to the BOA as all. Uh, I pay my respect uh, to the departed soul. Uh, coming down to the topic, as we all know and have been told a number of times that this is the very basic so uh, talk on the arthroscopy. So I have kept it up to the mark to where a person who has not done even a one arthroscopy, maybe he has seen one or two arthroscopy or even not that. So my talk would be very, very basic, very, very uh, short so that I can take as much as question and queries, if there are any. So arthroscopy is a surgery which is not a recent. And since it is for the young people who don't know or are really into arthros starting to get into arthroscopy, let me introduce them to arthroscopy. How to remove this? Yeah. So in 1912, you can see in the proceedings of 41st Congress of German Society of Surgeons in Berlin, it contained a presentation entitled Endoscopy of Closed Cavities by means of a trochat and endoscope. And the authors of this The author of this uh, was a Danish surgeon from RS named Severin Nordefer. And he had constructed an endoscope consisting of a trochor of five millimeter, which is approximately size, which we use nowadays. A fluid valve, again, we are using it, and an optic tube. In addition to the cystoscopy and laparoscopy, he reported that it could be used for endoscopy of a knee joint, especially for the early dissection of meniscal injury. So it was not a arthroscope at that time. It was basically an endoscope through which he could have done even a cystoscopy or laparoscopy and also a knee arthroscopy. In 1900, So in, again, now 1918, the first instance of endoscopy of the joint here, the endoscopy of joint was there, arthroscopy. Dr. Kenji Takai of Tokyo University used the interior of a cadaveric joint using a 7.3 millimeter cystoscope. He just took a cystoscope, put it to the joint. Again, in 1920, he modified a cystoscope and thereby developed a first joint scope. And if you see the structure of the scope and the trocker and the sheath here, uh, you can see that not very much has changed. Though technology has changed, but the structure is not dramatically changed. It still looks very much the same. In 1932, Takai presented an arthroscope at the meeting in Japanese Orthopedic Association and later applied it clinically in a knee joint filled with saline, which we do today. But again, in 1958, Mansky Pantave developed the first truly successful arthroscope. The diameter was 4.9 millimeter and the depth of the focus ranged from one millimeter to infinity. It really means that if you look into the joint, not only a specific part is clearly visible, even the farther, farther points are very much visible to you and clearly visible to you. So what, as a new arth arthroscopic surgeon, we should plan to do? A arthroscopic procedure should be of equal quality and effectiveness as those done in open. This is for other people, but for arthroscopists, the goal for every arthroscopic surgeon should be to perform the procedure 
better than he could have done with an arthrotomy. So as an arthroscopic surgeon, I should do it better, not equal to arthrotomy. We should be doing it in a better manner. Let's go down to an OT environment. Most commonly used place for arthroscopic surgery is the routine surgery at the hospital, uh, hospital orthopedic surgical OT. Not much as an arthroscopy orthopedic surgeon, we are ourselves quite, quite, quite stringent about the uh, sterility of the OT. And if that is there, the arthroscopic surgery can take place in those OT environment. I'm showing it. These are the old pictures showing you two uh, arthroscopic trolley, the endoscopic trolley. On the left hand side is the one which is specifically de dedicated to arthroscopy only. Here you can see the shaver, cameras, console unit, light source. But on the right, it is a general endoscopic setup. You can see the also uh, CO2 uh, cylinder there, uh, insufflator there. This can be used for multiple purposes, can be used for a laparoscopy, can be used for a cystoscopy, can be used for a hysteroscopy, uh, multi-dimensional uh, here. Before going into it, surgery, we should know what how to sterilize, that is the very important, very expensive instrumentation, based of a very flexible and uh, what is fragile instrumentation. And we are very afraid how to get it sterilized. Do we get it autoclave done or not? Most of the structure, the lens and other things we get are autoclavable with a minimally, but there are other methods where we can use like ETO, steam autoclave, guttural dehyde or formalin. Uh, the ETO is quite a good thing and it can be done and uh, we can have a very good sterility. The important thing, now we go to each and every instrumentation or the uh, instrumentation that we need there. First is the camera, which really we require. And it contains, it is the transmission system from the picture, i.e. that from the scope, which is into the joint, to the monitor through which we see. So instead of putting the eye into the uh, scope, we see it into the monitor. And to think that console that changes from camera, it has got a camera, fiber goes to the console, and then it goes to the uh, monitor. What camera help is, it is a more comfortable operating position for the surgeon. Uh, I don't know many of you, I have, I have seen people putting an eye into the uh, eyepiece of the lens, uh, arthroscope and looking into the joint. And it is a tremendous problem. And number of time we are there, we can put in some infection to there because the sterility gets compromised. But through this, a more comfortable operating position for the surgeons, it avoids contamination of the operating field by the surgeon's face. And the best part is involvement of the rest of the surgical team. If you look, you do surgery, only you know what you are doing. But once the, everybody is seeing it on the monitor, everybody is seeing, everybody is learning, everybody is there for, with you. The camera is with a V mount, T mount attaches directly to the eyepiece of the arthroscope. The C mount adapter allows, if you can see this is the basically the C mount on the which uh, adapter basically on which the scope gets attached. The C-mount adapter allows rapid interchange of arthroscope with difference less obliquity, which I will come back later. Single chip camera, three chip camera, now uh, 4K camera and uh, many things are coming, but these are only as per development of the monitor system we are getting in. Cable of arthroscope system, in which the video signal is transmitted from the to the monitor from the arthroscope by its own mini, and it has also got a own miniature light scope. So you don't need a cable now going to the console or the light cable coming down. It has all itself built in camera system, which by Wi-Fi sends the signals to the uh, monitor system. So no cables are required. It is in, uh, will come down any time now. Light source, so once we have got a monitoring system, we need a light source because we are putting it into a joint, a closed cavity. 
so we need some kind of light to see inside uh, mostly lights used now are led lights halogens xenons were there the fiber optic cable consists of a bundle of specially prepared glass fibers encased in a protective sheath the glass fibers are fragile it breaks and the cable should be handled very carefully one has to learn this and the length of the cable also affects the light transmission but the with better and better uh, light source coming in it doesn't make much of a difference but the quality of the cable and the fibers integrity should be good so uh, what is there in the light source there is a bulb led bulb is the attachment for the uh, light source cable and uh, there can be accessory and the uh, uh, built in fan mechanism to cool the because the light is uh, hot uh, now the cold sources are there you, there is a built in fan mechanism and through which the cable comes and attaches to the ultrascope and through it is it has got a, its own uh, light transmission unit and the lights come out from there so after camera and light source we go down to the most important thing the arthroscope it is the most important thing uh, it is basically our eye, eye of the surgeon uh, any new person going into doing arthroscopy do not compromise you can compromise in many of the other things do not compromise in the quality of the arthroscope 4 mm and 30 degree scopes are the most commonly used but there are other i will show you viewing area depends on the size of the scope a 4 mm scope has got a 115 degree of viewing area up uh, there are various kind of scope we have to just know it is 0 degree 30 degree 45 degree or 70 degree most commonly we use is a 30 degree why because i will show you in the next slide uh zero degree gives you a, a viewing area of say 75 degree but a 30 degree scope turns around it shows a oblique view if you can see this would have been with a zero degree it turn if you use a 30 degree it changes position and it can show you this large area by changing the position of the scope you can see this you can see even more area with a 70 degree or 90 degree but the problem is you get a blind scope uh, area it is in front of the lens you cannot see if you using a 70 degree scope you are looking here while you are going like this so this becomes a blind area and you might damage until you are very very happy with your hands and you have known the anatomy of your joint even blindly you can't uh, go through it so this is the advantage that's is why we say to use a 30 degree more commonly because there is no blind zone and uh, the area of view is quite large now trocker is a important thing it can be blunt or sharp it is the arthroscopy we dilate we don't cut any tissue we dilate the tissue while introducing the sheath so it helps uh, up semi sharp trocar is most commonly used it doesn't damage the uh, arterial cartilage if just in case it uh, get if you are new and gets into in front of a uh, articular cartilage a sheath uh, this sheath should match with the scope because each scope man the make of the scope has its own kind of a, a sheath so you have to see that your arthroscope and the sheath matches it protects scope from the abnormal stresses and it has got a inflow and outflow cannula and it locks with the scope once you have put it there and locked it it will stay at the same position so it would not fall arthroscope are quite expensive so it would not fall it is even of various types uh, but now with the high flow can sheets in there the amount of fluid which they can 
set in into the joint that distend the joint is quite more so high flow uh, especially when we are using it in shoulder and we don't have a pump high flow can uh, cannula or sheath are more commonly used and helpful now probe it is perhaps the most used and important diagnostic instruments after the arthroscope it is extension of the arthroscopist finger most probes are right angled with the tip of 3 to 4 mm look at it what you are having so where do we use the probe basically it is basic important in every every everything you use probe you feel the consistency of the structures such as articular cartilage to determine the depth of the chondromalacic areas because the probe has got a fixed angle uh, length after the angle so you can if you put that there if it is 4 mm you know depth is approximately 4 mm or less or more to identify and palpate loose structure within the joint such as tears of the menisci to maneuver loose bodies into the more accessible grasping position say it is in the posterior compartment you pull it down into the front intercondylar notch and you take it off easily to palpate the anterior cruciate ligament or other ligaments and determine the tension of the ligament and fibrous tissue within the joint to retract structure within the joint for exposure and to elevate the meniscus to see that the under surface can be viewed correctly because when we are looking at both the articular part and the uh, so just in case i'm showing you a use of a probe here if you see this we are doing arthroscopy and we go down there back feel the back of the meniscus we feel the meniscus we feel the articular cartilage of the and you can see the scope dips the probe dips into the articular cartilage you can see it very clearly and this is a early stage of osteochondritis desiccans we cannot visualize just by visualizing you cannot as you as soon as you probe you can see it dips there so this is the usefulness of the process similar you put a finger there you can feel it it dips and if you put a probe you can feel it is this tactile sensation every orthoscopic surgeon gets when he is using the uh, probe okay after the probe the important thing that we need are the punches of the scissor the cutting instrumentations uh, again you should have a couple of them which are of good quality because otherwise the li life is quite hellish if you get a pathology inside the punch biopsy process is one of the most commonly used operative arthroscopic instrument it has a open base you can see here it has got a open base which permits each punch and bite tissue to drop free into the joint so you don't have to pull it out every time as we do in uh, spinal punches we put it and then we take it out and the, the staff cleans it here it is not then that you just bite it and bite it and bite it again and again and again it comes with various shape and sizes depending on the what pathology you are dealing with so if we can show you a use of a punch there is a flap here of the meniscus there are normally 3 to 4 mm in diameter and jaws of scissor may be straight or hook so you just cut the flap tear and take it out so grasper again this is again useful for retrieval material from the joint it can be without without ratchet you can see a loose body being taken out After, these were the basic instrumentation when we are doing a basic arthroscopy i'm not going to any higher level because the number of instrumentation and other things increases irrigation equipment now not in vogue uh, rarely used by most of the arthroscopic surgeon rarely used by now uh, with, with coming in of high flow cannula the use of uh, this uh, pump has gone down even more even in the shoulder we are using less and less sometimes we do we do use in rotator cuff etc it ensures but we should know about it. it ensures a constant pressure in the joint may have an inbuilt suction system 
helps in maintaining the hemostasis as the pressure if the blood pressure uh, pressure is there in shoulder most commonly where you are not using the tourniquet it helps uh, uh, if the bleeding is there if you increase the pressure the bleeding will be less hanging a 3 liter bottle 4 feet above the patient gives enough pressure for knee so you don't need irrigation equipment all the time now shaver system this is an important thing it removes large amount of tissue in short time if you try to take out bit by bit by a punch it will take a long 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 time motorized system it is a motorized system with various configuration of the blade uh, you just need one or two uh, as per your choice consisting of an outer hollow sheath and an inner hollow rotating cannula, which I'll show you in the next slide with a corresponding window. It rotates or oscillate. It can rotate clockwise or it can rotate anti-clockwise and oscillates. There is a built-in suction mechanism, which every time they open, suction system pulls some tissue into it. And every time it rotates back over the window, it cuts it. There's a built-in suction mechanism to pull tissue into the covered blade and remove the excise part. So if you can see there, there is a window and something is oscillating. Every time this open comes up, the suction pulls it, the tissue into it, and the blade comes and cut it off, and it is sucked away. So basically, this is the principle of the uh, shaver system. So just in case I'm showing you here, uh, ACL with a lot of synovium was there. And uh, if you try to remove this amount of tissue by punch, it will take a long, long time. So once you put in a shaver in, and as soon as you start the shaver within a few seconds, you have almost, almost, almost taken away the tissue. And it is not only just taking out the tissue. Many of the time, you don't want, it is difficult to reach the punch there to cut the tissue in the posterior third of the meniscus. You may damage the articular cartilage. So if you go in by the punch, showing you various users, there are a number of other users, but these are the basic uses of the various instruments that we are using at the time. To start with, well, suction system very important. Um, the shaver system will not work without this. It can be machined or through your pipe, the hospital pipeline, uh, to be boost in outflow port of the shave or shaver should be controlled to prevent over sucking. The suck amount of suction that goes in should be controlled. Now, leg holder. Again, as irrigation, it is was used at the long time back, not mostly not used now. It gives, but it gives a proper hold to the thigh and allows the valgus and varus stress to look into the various look and corners of the joint. It obstructs, but it obstructs full movement of the limb. And especially if we are doing the ACL surgery with hyperflexion of the knee, it would be difficult to do on these. So not use side support is often good enough. So you can use it on a side support. You can put, it was also to talk about patient positioning. You can place the patient on the simple table in orthoscopic uh, surgery, and uh, you can uh, do all the positioning with a simple leg hold, the side support there, or you can even keep your knee at 90 degree bent, and you can do a uh, valgus, varus and valgus stress by figure of four. Now, to conclude, for a new person to the beginners, I will tell you what is the essential without which you cannot do a good arthroscopy or basic arthroscopy even uh, set aside good is a good camera, light source. You need arthroscope, basically minimal a 4 mm 30 degree probe, a couple of punches, grasper. It would be very optimum if you have got a good tourniquet and a very good shaver system. And arthro pump and leg holders are desirable. It is not really what you cannot do without. It is just uh, if you have working in a very big hospital and they are providing with you, you can have it. So these are the 
various instrumentation that we need to use. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Am I audible? Hello. Yes. Yes. Abhishek. Yes. 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 Uh, thank you for great insights, sir. I'm. I mean, uh, it was very very useful talk, and uh, it was a great insight about the instrument and positioning about uh, the uh, uh, arthroscopic surgery. And uh, I truly believe that uh, minimal invasive surgery is the way ahead. And uh, you, you know, like uh, it's good saying that less is more. So with such a small portals, now we are doing more and more surgeries. And keeping uh, the uh, talk going, uh, I invite Dr. Arvind Prasad Gupta, sir. Uh, and he's a consultant orthopedic surgeon at Paris Hospital. He will be talking on portal entry, arthroscopic anatomy, arthroscopic triangulation and instrument handling. And he will be showing us complete diagnostic arthroscopic video also, so, so that we can get benefit out of it. Uh, Arvind, sir, you can uh, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, VOA, for the opportunity. So I'll start with the portals of the knee joints and then diagnostic orthoscopy. So uh, before uh, going to that, uh, Dr. Rakesh Chaudhary boss has already uh, demonstrated wonderfully all the instrument, what we need for doing a orthoscopy of the knee joint. But I'll take one and a half minute extra. So this is the orthoscope that was showing. So this may be 30 degree. You can see this is the angle 30 degree. It means you are saying 70 and 90 degree. And this get connected with the light source cable, which illuminate the intra-articular structure, the structure which is inside the knee joint, get illuminated with this light cable. And with the handling, if it is down, you are seeing up. If it is on the three o'clock, it means you are seeing the nine o'clock. And if it is up, it means you are seeing the down. So it is up, now you are seeing the down. And further, this connected with the camera, which transmit the intra-articular structure to the monitor. So after connecting with the camera, you need to move the camera inside the knee. So this movement may be forward or backward. This may be rotatory movement in which you can rotate the camera itself or you can rotate the light source, left, right, up, down, and the sidewise movement also. This is the sidewise movement and then up and down. This is just a little bit, hardly two to three millimeter only. So next is about the handling. So you can handle the scope with uh, the two finger, camera with two finger also but that is not very strong grip. So holding this camera with thumb, palm, is the best grip with the left hand and use your two finger for the rotation of your light source. Maybe three o'clock, dawn, up, and 11, nine o'clock, whatever the position, so that your another hand is free for working portal, for your instrument. Like this, you can rotate this cable with the help of finger. So after this, next is about the focusing, uh, making a focus over the object with the camera and a scope. So if you place your scope too close to the object, then it will be very magnified. So it will be difficult to see that. And, th and if you, like this is highly magnified. So if you take back, and this is the appropriate position where you should place your scope. If you take too far, then it will be too small to see. So focus of the object with the scope and camera is very important. So after all these, we'll go to the portals. So there is multiple portals in the knee joint. The most commonly used is anterolateral and the anteromedial portals. The end, and rest are superolateral, superomedial, posteromedial, posterolateral, accessory, anterolateral, accessory, anteromedial, and the central portal of Gilchrist. So we'll see uh, 
separately one by one. This is the anterolateral uh, portals. This is the right knee. So this is on the lateral side of the knee. So first we should start with the marking of the knee joint. For the beginner, it's very important because many a time uh, orthoscopy surgery for a beginner takes very long time and knee getting start distended. In that case, the finding a anatomical structure become very difficult. So marking is very important. Start all your orthoscopy, initial 20, 30, 50 orthoscopy by making a marking only. So this is the patella. This is patella tendon. This is tibial tuberosity. And this is your joint line. So this anterolateral portal should be around one centimeter lateral to the patella tendon, one centimeter above the joint line and one centimeter below the tip of the patella. And this, how you make this portal, the knee angle should be around 70 degree. After uh, making a knife, using the knife, making the incision over the skin, this trocar and cannula, that was wonderful demonstrated by Rakesh Bot. You should go inside the knee and feel the condyles of the knee in the intercondylar area at 70 degree of knee flexion. Then you take the trocar cannula a little bit back and direct it superiorly. So at the angle of 30 degree of knee flexion, you should insert this trocar cannula in the patellofemoral joint or suprapatellar area. So here you should remove the trocar and place your scope inside this trocar and after putting this check for water flow as i have checked here and there also over the turp set many a time beginner don't think don't find this thing and this is closed and not seeing anything inside the knee joint this has happened many um, times for with me also in initial days the water is not inside the knee we cannot see anything so checking this water flow is very important and after that you check for the sideways movement of your scope inside the knee. See, you, initially it was not happening. So it must be in the suprapatellar area. As I took little bit back, so I'm in the patellofemoral area. So now I can move the scope sideways. So once this finding is there, it means you are inside the knee joint. This movement will not be possible if you are not in the inside, inside the knee joint. So once you are start moving this, then come to the medial condyle and flex the knee joint. So you are, you are again inside the uh, knee joint in intercondylar area. So this is about the anterolateral portal. So about the placement of the anterolateral portal, sometimes it get too high in spite of exactly one centimeter below the patellar tendon, particularly in thick patient, thick and fatty patient. If it is too high, then seeing posterior structure become difficult. If it is too medial, then there is chances of injury to the patellar tendon or you may stuck in the patellar fat pad. Or if it is too low, then you may damage the uh, anterior horn of the lateral meniscus or cartilage. Next is the anteromedial portal. The anatomy is same, but it is on the medial side. And this should be met under vision with the help of nedel or IV cannula. So that it should not damage the meniscus. And here's uh, the role of triangulation comes. Like this nedel, you can direct in this direction, but you are seeing in this direction. So sometimes nedel is not getting in focus, not in the vision area. So what you do, just put the needle, strike with the trocar and slide this needle toward the tip of the trocar so that your tip of the needle will be in lighted area. So this is called as triangulation. When two instrument, one instrument is in lighted area of the light source that is in, in the scope area. So this is the triangulation. This is very important for the beginners. You can do it at your table also, with closing eye, no need for the object, knee joint or a scope or anything. Just take two pen, close your eye 
and try to triangulate. That is the habit you should make if you want to do orthoscopy. So next, after this, when triangulation is confirmed, you find this trajectory is fine. You put the knife and you can enlarge the fat or capsule incision of the knife by putting a artery forceps inside this because many a time this is a working portal because of that you put lot of instrument your this uh, probe may get uh, stuck there your saver may get uh, stuck there so you can enlarge the intra articular capsular or fat pad a skin incision will be the same but the capsule and fat pad will get enlarged and so your passage will be smooth so you can see here you just put the needle and look whether it is your illuminated area or not. If it is not, then you can change and then put the knife. And after putting the knife, like this instrument, if you are using, then there is chances this may get stuck. So take the artery forceps, the skin area is same. You just enlarge the capsula and fat pad area. So your this uh, passage of instrument will be a smooth. So for early days, this is very good idea to use your hemostat for doing this. You can see the intraarticular uh, uh, vision also. This is the needle, which is well above the meniscus. So uh, vision of this needle is very important. Many a time it's low and there is chances of damaging of the meniscus. So once needle is placed and you find this is exactly the same where you want to put then you cut the capsule and fat with the knife along with the skin and once this is of good size then you put the instrument inside your knee joint like saber I start with the saber and save little bit of your fat like here you can see this is the fat in early days, this fat make a disturbance for you in many number of cases. So it's always better to take this uh, retropatellar fat that, that comes in front of your scope. If you are mature enough, then you can manage without saving this fat pad. But in early days, I'll recommend go for saving of some fat pad on the anterolateral part so that this should not comes in front of your scope. And so that you can see all the structure without any hindrance. At the same time, with that portal, you just check your instrument is reaching each corner of your knee joint or not. Like this is the body of the medial meniscus, which is torn. At the same time, you can insert in the posterior medial uh, corner side where you can see the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, then the intercondylar area. Then on the lateral side, you can see the anterior horn of lateral meniscus. Then in the making little bit of virus with figure of four, you can the posterior horn of lateral meniscus and meniscus and popliteus is there. The lateral meniscus is also torn. And this is the popliteus and all the gutter, medial side and lateral side. So if your anteromedial portal is at perfect place, so without any disturbance, you can travel all around the knee very easily. So this portal is very important. So choose that place in a very uh, accurate way so that there is no any hindrance by in placing your instrument. Next is posteromedial portal. That is very important portal. <coughs> the landmark is the semi-membranous and anteriorly the MCL and the inferiorly there is medial head of gastrocnemius usually one centimeter above the joint line. At 90 degree of knee flexion, your trocar and cannula should be in the posterior lateral corner with your light source to the opposite side, you should so that you are weighing the posterior lateral, posterior medial corner and illuminate the skin also. That give you an idea where you should place your needle or your knife. But be careful as safeness vein and nerves come. So with illumination, you can little bit identify this safeness vein. So you should be around five millimeter away from this vein so that you can escape the safeness nerve. 
So illumination help you in finding this Cephnus vein. So here you can see this is the tokar and keluna that is at 90 degree of knee flexion is inside the posteromedial corner with light source on that side. So you are seeing the posteromedial corner there. Like this is the uh, medial condyle of the femur. And this is the PCL. This is the posterior horn of a medial meniscus. Here you start going inside the knee joint. So your trocar and cannula is going in. Trocar and cannula, uh, trocar is going in along with the scope. So this is the posterior uh, capsule. So now you are inside the posterior medial cannula. Suddenly you lose the tightness. So now you can turn the light source so that you can see the posterior medial corner there. And here posterior medial corner and then you pass your needle. This may, this may be a, a inferior posterior medial portal, superior posterior medial portal, depending upon what uh, the work you want to do in this area. This portal help in doing synovectomy, removal of loose body, lot of loose body, in particular synovial chondromatosis part, or reconstruction of the PCL, working portal, or many a time, nowadays there is a lot of ramp lesion, that, that is called as the hidden lesion, that get identified and repair with the help of this portal. So in this also, you can see, this was the ramp lesion. This is the posterior horn of medial meniscus, and you can see the capsule was separated from the medial meniscus. So with this portal, we can repair this ramp lesion also. The next is the superolateral portal. That is, this is 2.5 centimeters superior to the upper pole of patella and almost lateral to the quadriceps tendon. Again, this should be made under vision with the needle. And this also act as a weighing portal also, along with the working portal. You can use it as a weighing portal for the patellofemoral articulation. In fact, this portal is one of the best portal to look for patellofemoral articulation. Like this, here you can see fully distended knee with uh, this uh, straight uh, light cable. So you can sing, uh, sing there with the needle, you just make a puncture there and you find your uh, thing is at a normal place where you want. And after confirmation of the exact place, you can put the knife there in the skin and then you can use the saber and other instrument like you can see this interarticular part, this uh, in the superior lateral area, there you can place your knife, knife along a needle, then followed by the knife. And then you take the orthoscope in that portal. Here you can see you are seeing from above below, from the superior lateral portal, this is the top clear glue and this is the patella. So you can see this patellofemoral articulation is very beautiful, can be seen from this portal. So any uh, malalignment of the patella, recurrent dislocation of patella or recurrent subluxation of patella thing, this can be very beautifully seen from this, uh, the superior lateral portal. So this is the trochlea, this is patella, very good articulation is there. Next is the posterior lateral portal. Again, very important portal for uh, PCL reconstruction. Uh, this act as a wing portal and the posterior medial portal act as a working portal, everything from the posterior aspect. This is the soft spot between the LCL and lateral head of the gastrocnemius and just above the posterior lateral corner of the TBL plotting. So this is the area. Here, the, uh, the posterior to the biceps femoris, common perilion of passes. So always try to mark the biceps femoris before making this posterior lateral portal. So here again at 90 degree, your scope is in uh, the posterior lateral corner. 
the light source is on opposite side so you can see the postulateral corner get illuminated and now you pass the needle into that and then similarly this uh, uh, needle followed by the knife so here in the postulateral corner this is the lateral condyle of the femur so you can see you can find the exact place where you want this is the needle then followed by the knife and then you pass uh, trocar cannula or wisinger rod whatever the thing so uh, with this portal and you can use uh, as a viewing portal or working portal whatever you want usually used for loose body removal or complete synovectomy particularly synovial chondromatosis loose body removal or if there is septic arthritis or pcl reconstruction next is entero accessory enterolateral portal or accessory enteromedial portal very important portal particularly for orthoscopic acl reconstruction by trans uh, portal method so it is usually around 2.5 cm from the patella tendon be careful about the mcl while making this accessory enteromedial portal so here yeah, we'll see uh, this is trajectory of the bead pin through the extender enteromedial portal so this is going high very high other than the anatomical place of natural acl which is supposed to be here so this is going high and when you place same bead pin through the accessory enteromedial portal you can see this is the accessory enteromedial part and exactly you are pointing to the root the anatomical place of your acl so this accessory enteromedial portal is used when you are making the knee hyperflex with anatomical reconstruction of your acl so where you can see and when you hyperflex the knee this almost uh, pointed at 90 degree to the condyle lateral condyle of the femur only thing you have to look for any uh, you should avoid any injury to the uh, the medial condyle of the femur cartilage lesion of the medial condyle of the femur while putting the reamer over this bead pin while making the acl reconstruction with accessory enteromedial portal the next is the central transpatellar portal of gilkes usually it is made at 90 degree of knee flexion with tendon the so patella tendon under the tension usually 1 cm inferior to the lower pole of patella used for acl spine avulsion you are directly over that with your jig or your stabilizing structure and another portal you can use for the placement of the jig uh, then uh, for the anterior horn of lateral meniscus or anterior horn of the medial meniscus in the transeptal in between the acl and pcl if you want to go posteriorly you can use this portal that is very important helping portal when you are using the transeptal portal and going to the posterior to the acl and pcl so after portal uh, next is the diagnostic orthoscopy so all these uh, structure you should see along with the cartilage of the tibia and femur the acl attachment pcl root of both medial meniscus lateral meniscus posterior root anterior root body all these uh, structure you should see like this acl so along with the cartilage this is the acl very frequently we do surgery for the acl so how this anatomical changes with flexion and extension you can see here also in flexion this become very uh, horizontal your acl so be uh, careful and keep in mind particularly for the beginning and while extension this looks like this so this is the orthoscopy part will diagnostic orthoscopy will see with 30 degree of knee flexion around 20 to 30 degree and this tocar and scope is in the suprapatellar area then you take it back little bit so it will come over the trochlear area and your light source is going up so you are seeing the down 
this trochlea will be visible and when you when your light source is down you are seeing the under surface of the patella up you are seeing the up so under surface of patella is visible then you make the angle of the knee around 90 degrees swipe your scope to the medial gutter and comes to the medial gutter then the uh, the medial meniscus is visible there then do the valgus so that you can see the complete body of the medial meniscus. At the same time, you also assess the medial condyle of the femur, medial condyle of the tibia, then the intercondylar area, see the ACL. Then from the intercondylar part, you come to the ACL and PCL in the inter, then the lateral compartment of the knee, root of the lateral meniscus then the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, then body of the lateral meniscus. And then in the lateral gutter of the lateral meniscus. And then again from here, you can go to the suprapatellar fossa. So you can see how your scope move, how, how your this uh, Light source cable moves according to the need, whether you see downward, upward, what are the structure you are seeing. Thank you. Nice demo, Arvind. Thank you, Vos. Manish, sir, you are muted. You are muted, Manisha. Audible? Yes, yes, yes. It was a nice presentation by Dr. Avin. So our next presenter is uh, Dr. Rajiv Rahman from Kolkata. And uh, he is going to speak upon the different aspects of uh, arthroscopic meniscectomy and the other aspects of it. So I think Dr. Rahman, you can start your presentation. Thank you, Bure, for invitation, and thanks, Rakesh Chaudhary sir and Arvind for excellent uh, uh, lectures. It was a really a very good video presentation by Arvind and very good basic presentation by Rakesh Chaudhary sir. So I will be talking on arthroscopic meniscal balancing, microfracture, synovectomy, loose body removal, because these are the basic surgery you start once you start the diagnostic arthroscopy after diagnostic arthroscopy, and you should know. I think. Every orthopedic surgeon, arthroscopy surgeon has started their arthroscopy journey with these four basic surgery. So you should know how to do it and what are the tips and tricks of doing this uh, surgery. So first, meniscal balancing. So what is meniscal balancing? Normally, if you have a meniscus tear, either you repair it or you deprive it. So whenever, in nowadays, we want to save most of the part of the meniscus. It's not like complete debridement of meniscus because we at least we try to save the rim of the meniscus so that there's a least chance of uh, uh, knee arthritis. So this is procedure is called meniscal balancing. So this is a small video, if you see. So when you want to save the meniscus and when you should, you should think, yes, this meniscus is not severed. This is your, you can see here, the lateral meniscus, you can see the popliteus tendon, and this is only a superficial tear of the lateral meniscus. And if you probe it, you see your probe is not going down in uh, crossing the undersurface of the meniscus has healed properly. So such type of meniscus tear where you have a good meniscal tissue, it's only a partial tear. You should not debride it. Try to preserve those meniscus. Just saving of the superior border, or sometimes if it's an undersurface tear, saving of the undersurface will uh, have a good healing potential for that meniscus. Now see it on the medial side. You can see here, this is a classical bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus. You can see it has, a, it has an anterior attachment, it has a posterior attachment. If it is attached over the anterior and posterior aspect, it's a bucket handle tear. If it is attached over one end only, it's a flap tear. You may have a complex tear also. So you can see, I'm reducing it, it's a thin fibrile tissue. So this is not a repairable meniscus. So don't waste your anchor on such type of meniscus. The ideal treatment for such thin, old tear 
in white white zone is meniscal balancing or meniscectomy again i assure you always try to preserve the rib you can see now i am covering the posterior part that is the attachment of the posterior part and here you have the attachment of the anterior part it's like a handle of a bucket you have to wear one on the posterior aspect one on the anterior aspect so always for meniscectomy for such type of bucket and they start from the posterior aspect try to cut the posterior horn attachment of the posterior horn first and the best instrument is either your arthroscopic scissor or punches as described by rajesh sir uh, rakesh choudhary sir you use those, this instrument to detach the posterior horn so you can see gently just with the basket punch i am trying to remove the attachment from the posterior horn so once you have removed the attachment of the posterior horn you are converting a bucket handle tear into flap tear it will be a free flap you can see now it's a free flap so now i am converting a bucket handle tear into a free uh, flap tear now it's time to at remove the attachment of the uh, over the anterior horn you can see this is the anterior horn of the meniscus to try to remove it from the neck area of the attachment of the meniscus and you can use your arthroscopic scissor you can use your punch and then you can see the whole of the meniscus is now floating at this time this is the right time you put your basket inside and try to take the meniscus out and you most of the time it will come in total sometime if it has some attachment there you can use your saver blood to divide that part and you can see here this is your meniscal balancing now you have some unstable layer on the posterior horn and the anterior horn or body also so try to divide that part so that you have a good meniscal balancing for that we can use our saver blade this is a you as well you can use a 4 mm saver blade or 4.5 mm saver blade you can just divide some amount of the cartilage striation is there start from the posterior horn and you see here gradually try to divide the unstable layer if you have a complex tear also try to preserve the stable layer and divide the unstable layer and once you have done your dividement this is the sixth finger of arthroscopic surgeon we call it probe with this probe pull the meniscus if the meniscus is not coming inside the joint those are part of stable plan stable part but if after pulling some of the part is coming inside the joint it's a unstable tear try to balance it with a saber or a basket punch here you can see there was a unstable medial layer of the medial meniscus so we are trying to just balance it with a basket so now with this we don't use the term meniscectomy we use the term meniscal balancing because we want to balance this meniscus and at the end of this meniscectomy you will see how we have balanced the meniscus and you should have a uniform meniscal rim from anterior horn to the posterior horn now you see we have divided we are just by taking a bite over the unstable layer and your shaver is the best part to smoothen that medial part of the meniscus and with this shaver you can just smoothen the medial part of the meniscus you can see and there is a good debridement of the medial meniscus and if you see if you go a bit back you can see whole of whole whole of the meniscus in toto with balanced and it's a stable rim which we have preserved and this is important part of meniscectomy the meniscal balancing always always try to save the peripheral rim of the meniscus now you can see here the whole of the peripheral rim has been preserved it's a stable rim and you can see there is a no unstable layer there and that is ideal meniscal balancing the second talk which <laughs> is very important nowadays in athletic population or non athletic population we get osteochondral defect ideally it you may get a small defect or a large defect for small defect small to moderate size defect which is 1 to 2 cm square we the ideal treatment still today is microfracture but for larger defect we have different treatment modalities with that doesn't come in uh, basic uh, knee arthroscopy course so today we will talk about microfracture what is microfracture normally if you have a osteochondral defect and your subchondral bone is exposed so what we do we just Uh, drill it, or we uh, with a microfracture, all which uh, uh, we make a hole inside the uh, subchondral bone, so that we have a bleeding hole in the hole of the raw area. What happens once your tunicate uh, it has been removed? There is a blood clot formation over that raw area. Ultimately, there is a formation of hyaline cartilage, uh, fibrous cartilage. So normally we have a hyaline cartilage in our uh, joint, but with this this uh, uh, 
blood clot usually transfers with the fibrous cartilage. The, the quality of this fibrous cartilage is not as good as hyaline cartilage, but yes, it gives symptomatic relief to the patient. Again, you can preserve this knee or preserve this patellofemoral joint for another 5, 10 or 15 years, avoiding the knee replacement. So this is a small video demonstration of microfracture. The first part is identify the lesion. And most of the time you will see there are unstable layer of the articular cartilage along the osteochondral defect. Here you can see this is my osteochondral defect and this is the unstable rim of cartilage. So what do you do with your basket punch or sometimes with your ring curate, try to remove this unstable layer. The first and most important step of microfracture is try to remove the unstable cartilage rim around the osteochondral defect. So this is a U-shaped osteochondral defect you can see here. And these are the unstable rim of the cartilage. So you can use this ring curate also. It, is, it has a sharp border both over the superior and the inferior surface to remove this unstable uh, cartilage. Once your cartilage rim is stable, now this is the right time to balance the cartilage rim. Like we balance the meniscus, here we are balancing the cartilage rim and you can use your shaver blade to balance the cartilage rim. The next step is microfracture. You can see these are the microfracture all. Normally it comes in the depth from 5 to 8 millimeter. So you should go minimum 5 to 6 millimeter inside the subchondral bone because we want a bleeding hole there in the subchondral bone so that there is the adequate blood clot is formed over the osteochondral defect. And finally, in due course of time, we will get a fibrous cartilage over that osteochondral defect. So the rule of microfracture is start from the periphery, then go towards the center. And you should have at least two to three millimeter of subchondral bone in between two holes. You can see, so start from the periphery and go in the center. And by this way, you are creating a microfracture. Now, once you remove the tunicate, this is very important. You see the bleed, uh, blood uh, bleeding from the each hole. And this is very important. Confirm it that yes, whatever work you have done, you have done microfracture, whether that microfracture was adequate or not. Remove the tunicate, see that. And after that, wash the joint and keep this limb immobilized for seven to ten days because we want this clot to be stable there and normally if it is in the weight bearing area of the uh, tibiofemoral joint i usually don't allow the patient to wear weight for at least uh, two to three weeks so that we have a smooth fibrous cartilage formation formation over the osteochondral defect now synovectomy if you ask me, this is not, uh, uh, this doesn't come in a basic knee arthroscopy because it's very challenging. It's like a frozen shoulder. If you are dealing with a shoulder joint, uh, your shoulder arthroscopy surgeon, you start your surgery with a frozen shoulder. Everything is red inside and the whole of the joint is inflamed. Same happens when we have an indication for synovectomy. Either it may be a rheumatoid knee, it may be a knee of chronic synovitis, or you are dealing with a knee of uh, uh, villonodular synovitis. Most of these knees are inflamed knees. So you put your scope inside, you see everything is red. What we have seen in live surgery workshop, what we have seen in Dr. Uh, Arvin demonstration, it's not white, everything is red very difficult to identify the anatomical structure. The whole of the knee is swollen. So I will suggest the arthroscopy surgeon, the junior arthroscopy surgeon who are viewing this uh, webinar, please, please, please don't go for synovectomy in early stage of your learning. It needs, it needs a long learning curve because you have synovectomy. It's not a simple part. You start from knee joint, the intercondylar notch, go to the posterolateral compartment, posteromedial compartment, median and lateral compartment, then the supramatopatella pouch. These are the five steps for synovectomy. So once I put my scope inside, you can see here, this is a red joint inside. You can see the whole of the villus formation is there. It's a, it was a rheumatoid, one of the commonest indication for synovectomy. And you can see the synovium is proliferating. It's a red joint. Now, through your anteromedial portal, put your saver blade inside. I start my synovectomy through the intercondylar notch, not through the suprapatellar fossa. And you can see here, so once you start saving, you get some differentiation of anatomic structure. Now I can see my femoral condyle. Once I am saving the intercondylar, intercondylar, uh, intercondylar region, you can see your ACL, degenerated ACL or PCL, you can see here. And you can see the red synovium here. So try to divide it. You can use your saver blade, you can use your radio frequency device. But my friend, I don't prefer RF device because of risk of chondrolysis. 
after sinovectomy by using a rf device is quite uh, it has been repeated uh, many times in literature so uh, i use sever blade the important thing is that most of the time when you are using the sever blade what happens once your suction is on there will be abnormal bleeding there and try to avoid uh, those are bleeding by just closing your suction now once you have done your intercondylar notch the second step is you can see here my uh, second area is posterolateral corners i want to address my posterolateral corner uh, first and arvind has very well demonstrated a posterolateral portal it's very easy in an ascent it was very tough in a rheumatoid knee you see you everything is yellowish you have fibrosis also there the with a 11 number blade under the uh, light illumination i am making my posterolateral portal and now you put your blade inside the most and important point at this stage is that your blade should be towards the joint intercondylar region not towards the synovial tissue because you, you are very close to neurovascular bundle you can see here now i am going come for synovectomy of the posterolateral uh, corner so this is the synovectomy of the posterolateral corner that should be done through the posterolateral portal which has been very well demonstrated by arvin so intercondylar notch go to the posterolateral corner now we have four more uh, three more area uh, uh, are there where we have to go for synovectomy after the you can see gradually i am getting a space in the posterolateral corner whole of the red synovium had been debrided and almost it's like a subtotal synovectomy of the posterolateral corner believe me my friend it's very difficult to go for a, such type of synovectomy extensive synovectomy in open process you it's very difficult to assess the posterolateral corner it's very difficult to assess the posteromedial corner you are just doing a synovectomy of the suprapatellar pouch when you are doing in openly but arthroscopic yes you can reach those area which is not possible by open procedure now i start from my medial corner you can see this is my medial gut medial aspect of the knee and you can see the synovial profusion there of the medial side again go for synovectomy of the medial part normally you have synovitis over the supra meniscal area in the medial and lateral compartment so go for synovectomy always always see that you are not damaging the, the menisco capsular junction here you can see the whole of the supra meniscal area you have inflammation you have villus type of synovium there it's a red synovium inflamed synovium go for synovectomy in the medial compartment so just i will run this video fast so that and and now this is synovectomy of the medial compartment so once you have done the synovectomy of the medial compartment next comes synovectomy of the posteromedial compartment as so while you dealing with the medial compartment most of this rheumatoid knee has some time amount of degenerative meniscus tear also so you can go for meniscal balancing in the same sitting because it's uh, the panels it doesn't it's the cartilage also it is the meniscal tissue also it is the synovial tissue also so you can see this is almost a synovectomy of the medial compartment so once you have completed the synovectomy of the medial compartment now you should go to the posteromedial compartment again or what are been told the way to the posteromedial compartment is your posterior medial portal again you try to put your scope inside the posteromedial compartment see for the light with a needle introducing the needle first then make a posteromedial portal and in inflamed knee in rheumatoid knee or willow nodular synovitis always you will get lots of inflammatory tissue in the posteromedial compartment so here you can see there was a, some meniscal uh, tear was also there so after meniscectomy we have went for meniscal balancing also and now we have entered the posteromedial compartment you can see the adhesion there in the posteromedial compartment which, which we don't see in the virgin knee and now with your needle make your posteromedial portal you can see here with the spinal needle i am making my posteromedial portal now cut the posteromedial uh, capsule with your 11 number blade and now go for synovectomy of the posteromedial compartment so once you have done synovectomy of the posterior medial compartment you have completed the intercondylar notch the lateral compartment the medial compartment uh, the uh, medial compartment the posterior medial compartment now it's time to go to the lateral compartment you can see here again in lateral compartment you will get synovial tissue in the supra meniscal area sometime in the infra meniscal area also try to divide those tissue but avoid damaging the popliteal test tendon you are very close to popliteal test tendon sometime we have seen the whole of the panus has just Uh, covered the popliteal test tendon to so when you are dealing with synovectomy of the posterior half of the lateral meniscus be cautious because you have popliteal test tendon and the last part is the so after 
synovectomy of the petal of humerus jaw. Now you go towards the suprapetal approach. You can see now I am the suprapetal part. My femur down is my toclear group. Above you is the suprapetal synovium. And here you get maximum amount of synovial tissue. And what synovectomy we do in open synovectomy is the suprapetal synovectomy only. It's not possible to assess the posteromedial corner, the posterolateral corner, the supraminiscal area, and the inframeniscal area in open synovectomy. So in supra Petal pouch normally start from the center, then go to the medial gutter, and then go to the lateral gutter. Here you can see after center synovectomy, I am going towards the lateral side, then you go towards the medial side. So there are five steps of synovectomy. You start with the intercondylar notch, go to the lateral compartment, that is a posterior lateral compartment. Your portal is posterior lateral portal. Go to the medial compartment. Go for a supra inframeniscal synovectomy, go to the posterior medial compartment, lateral compartment, and finally the supra pedal And that completes your complete synovectomy for an inflamed knee of in any case of chronic synovitis. And finally, loose body removal. If you see it's a, a very it's like a video game. Loose body removal is always like a video game. So uh, sometimes it's a 30 second job, and sometimes it's a uh, half an hour or 15 minutes. So there are some tricks. So whenever you are removing a loose body, you can see most of the time you see in X-ray that loose body is in particular area. But when you put your scope aside, you see this it's not there. So what are the common area where will you search for the loose body? So we have some dependent area in the knee joint. The most dependent part is the gutter, the medial and lateral gutter. What Arvind has shown in the arthroscopy, once you put your scope in the suprapetal pouch, go and see the medial gutter and see the lateral gutter. The second, third most dependent part is your posteromedial compartment. It's a large compartment. It can have a large loose body there. And fourth most important part is the posterolateral compartment. So see the both gutter, the posteromedial, and the posterolateral compartment. If you don't get your loose body in routine diagnostic roundup, so these are the four areas you should see always you try to see and identify yes where is my loose body so you in mri you will get a loose body in the suprapatellar pouch but when you put your scope inside you may get in the post medial compartment here you can see that was the case here in mri we saw it it was in the suprapatellar pouch but we put, put our scope inside it was in the post medial compartment three important points are there first Identify the size of the loose body and your skin incision to remove that loose body should be larger than, uh, 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 than what is the size of the loose body. Otherwise, what happens when you are pulling this loose body out, sometimes it may get entrapped in in, between this synovium and the capsular tissue or skin. Second, if you have a less than one centimeter of the loose body, you can use your cannula. So you take your loose body, if it your grasper or your uh, artery forceps or your cocker forceps, if the loose body just slips from those. In those cases, in those cases, you just take your cannula out, you can take out this loose body. And third and most important part is whenever you are removing this loose body, stop your water flow. So what happens whenever the water flow, you have made your two portals or three portals, there's a turbulence inside the knee joint. So always, always stop the water flow whenever you are holding the loose body or you moving the loose body. This is very important part. So here you can see the loose body is in the posteromedial compartment. So I am making my posteromedial portal. This is my posteromedial needle. You can see over that I am making my posteromedial portal. You can use it, remove it without your cannula or with the cannula. Here we are removing it with the cannula. It's a, it's a large loose body, almost one centimeter or a, 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 a and so you make your port larger or use a large cannula to remove this loose body. And you can see, once you open the water, the loose body starts, there's a turbulence inside the knee joint. It will just float here and there, and it's like a, you are catching a mouse inside the knee joint. So it's very difficult to identify that loose body. Now you can see, sometimes you need to dilate the, uh, your, uh, your uh, postmodial portal also to remove this loose body. So second important step is, see the size of the loose body. The best instrument is you can use your troker or you can use your probe to identify what is the length of the loose body. And if it is, you can see, uh, yes, just I will show you, yeah. So you can just measure the length of the loose body, yeah, whether it's one, 1 1.5 centimeter like that. Accordingly, you put your skin incision. So sometimes your, your portal, small portal may not be, uh, it, it's very difficult to remove the loose body through this small portal. Then once you had identified it, you can use three instruments. You can use your grasper, 
which are shown by different type of gas pores are there rakia sir is shown you can use artery forceps you can use your cocker forceps because you want a good hold over uh, uh, now here you can see i am using a cannula and gradually you stop your flow you see you, you lose body is stable then this is the right time to put your basket punch or uh, or your uh, toker inside and normally don't try to hold it over the tip try to hold the loose body over the central part so that you will have a good grip you can see i am holding it over central part and with rotating movement try to take it off so if you are not using cannula with rotating movement, don't try to take the because sometimes it it will the, the loose body may stuck in between the skin and synovium so try to take out with rotating movement you can see here just try to rotate and they gradually you will you will see your loose body weight coming out so three important steps in removal of the loose body first thing is stop the water flow when you are holding the loose body because at that time if you keep water flow on because you have made your portals the loose body will become turbulent second you hold it not at the periphery at the center always try to hold it with a cocker or a basket forceps at the center and try to take it out by rotating movement and these are the three important step if you follow i think it will be a easy job you can do it in 30 second one minute not struggling to remove this loose body for half an hours or hours thank you my friend i think this was a small video demonstration of four common cases we can do as a basic arthroscopy surgery procedure thank you sir i mean now i am going to uh for any kind of questions they want to ask we'll start with uh, dr ratne sir do you want to ask any unmute yourself unmute unmute it was a night nice presentation and uh, definitely very clear but uh, sometimes uh, i'm asking dr arvin what you do if you find that your uh, entry portal is not correct then what you do sometimes after doing even uh, taking all the landmarks sometimes the entry portals are not correct in that case what you do yeah you are right many a time particularly in thick patient <clears throat> ob is 100 110 120 kg patient sometimes this portal marking is not uh, right and your portal is not right so once you met the wrong portal so no you know better which should be what should be the right portal so create another portal immediately without any uh, struggling with that portal just create another portal the right portal what you want to make yeah this should be very clear to all the newcomers because sometimes they struggle with the portal which is actually wrong so yeah. try to choose yes, the start. portal and make the perfect so, portal and then start again so the first portal is normally anterior lateral portal which we make yeah. first portal so say it is gone wrong but we can looking onto it get a correct enteromedial portal that is mm. for sure we can get a correct enteromedial portal dilate it put your scope into the enteromedial portal see the lateral part and then with a needle make a, a perfect uh, enterolateral portal so no guessing first thing you guess after first there is no guessing everything is under vision so if you fail first time go to the enteromedial portal look to the uh, lateral uh, enterolateral corner and see put a needle again and you can always uh, make a differentiate the most common fault which we go in the enterolateral portal either we go too low or we go too high so a important thing is make a vertical portal uh, incision so you can get a bit above a bit below these are very small tricky thing which you once you are doing the arthroscopy you will just your uh, sense will tell you what to do and what not to do so basically that is the way we do it Yes, second problem. Uh, usually, uh, Dr. Rakesh Chaudhary, uh, yep. what are the con uh, conditions when we try to prefer a high anteromedial portal? Or when should we think of a high anteromedial portal? High anteromedial portal you can use when you first when you are using a, a what do you call a PCL. If you are going to do a PCL, you are to look down there and view for the or any ramp posterior. ramp lesion uh, you from above you see and while you are doing your surgery from the posterior medial or posterior lateral corner so there is a place where you can go down from the above you see down if you are just flat on the joint the space between the articular surface and your uh, lens is not much because you cannot go any further or if you are just behind it would be a problem for you so you go a higher bit higher so that the distance between the articular surface 
and your lens is a bit more so you have got a wide space to see and then you can take the surgical instrumentation have a good view of your surgical instrumentation and you can uh, perform your surgery there nice anyone wants to add to it uh, little bit i disagree with boss so enteromedial portal is working portal so high enteromedial portal is for tcl reconstruction so that your jig or your instrument mm. can goes posterior down in the tibia if you want to view posteriorly so it should not be the high enterolateral portal because in that case it will be difficult to see posteriorly so for enteromedial portal for tcl reconstruction boss is exactly same you should be high as much as high possible so that you can go posterior down to the posterior part of the tibia with your jig or it your curette or rasp whatever you are using but for going to the posterior part you should not be high rajiv boss yes normally what happens the anterolateral portal i keep high because i want to uh, avoid the retropatellar effect the anteromedial portal you can keep high in if you are PCL, doing a pcl reconstruction what happens our jig the pcl jig the tibial jig it's not a straight jig it's like a curve you have a curved jig so if you try to give to uh, put toward the and to inferior medial portal there's every chance of damage of the cartilage it not sit properly also always try to fit over the high anteromedial portal second thing is that in low anteromedial portal is also important if you are fixing your pcl with a screw because if you try to fix it to the high medial portal yeah and you are fixing it through the inside out technique i think it's very difficult and those technique you have to use a low portal so that you are perpendicular to the uh, lateral surface of the medial femoral condyle very good uh, as far as the pcl reconstruction is considered actually the isolated pcl tears are not very common but if at all for isolated pcl reconstruction with an intact acl what are the uh, precautions or what are the tricks where you can enter into the posterior medial compartment or the posterior lateral compartment without damaging your intact acl so any particular tricks to avoid damage to the acl while you are negotiating to enter into the posterior medial or posterior lateral compartment the best way is you use your switching rod switching rod so suppose this is your acl so you have a space between your lateral surface of the media uh, uh, lateral condyle medial surface and acl so use your switching rod put your switching rod inside the posterior medial compartment over that put your token inside and that is the best way when you are synovitis or all like that you are directly in the posterior medial compartment and without damaging the acl i think you can you can you, you can go for a pcl nice. so yes. uh, dr manish if yeah. your pcl is torn so you will not have any problem in putting your trocar and a scope inside the posterior medial corner because one side is the pcl other side is the uh, the medial condyle of the femur so once pcl is not there so you will not have any problem in putting your scope trocar cannula inside the posterior medial portal corner and once you are there you make the posterior medial portal and start working from the that side and once you have met the posterior medial portal so it's depend upon you whether you want to work completely from the posterior then you met the posterior lateral corner at the same time and the make the viewing portal of your this uh, posterior lateral corner and working portal is posterior medial portal if you don't want to make posterior lateral corner you can continue with the anterior lateral corner uh, portal but in that case you use 70 degree of the scope that will increase your viewing so anything you work from the posterior and you you are seeing from the anterior side so your acl is not going to damage okay. even if you want to operate both all the things from the anterior side then start with 30 degree scope and go debride the pcl completely from the femoral side then you will have enough area for the play then switch your 30 degree scope with the 70 degree so that you can see the this uh, the sinai fiber of the medial meniscus posterior on that is going down and even you push that you can see the root of the pcl so in that case your scope is on that side toward the acl side 
So you are not going to damage the ACL at all. Thank you. To bride the PCL, you will get enough room. Yeah. You will divide all the PCL, keep your uh, uh, shaver away from the ACL and also divide the pad in between. You will get enough play, enough room for all the instrumentation and even your scope. It will not damage ACL. Import important thing is that if you are debriding the whole of the PCL, then it is not a much of a problem. But if you want to preserve some remnant, then uh, there is a problem that you have to go between the two excess, the top, and you go to the cut the inter uh, posterior septum, and then you are able to visit. And then you, your scope goes into the posterior part. Posteromedial uh, uh, port becomes your viewing portal. And you work in between because you are viewing from behind. And now you are working from the enteromedial or enterolateral portal as a working portal. And then you start doing surgery if you are viewing from posterior. And then uh, you can do most of the surgery from there also when you are not uh, taking off the PCL. If but you are taking off the PCL, then doesn't. Yeah. If, uh, if you are uh, taking off PCL, Manish doesn't. Was, yeah. Manish was asking when the remnant preserving, but nowadays we, are, we have shifted to remnant preserving. And that exactly. is important what Akesh sir has told. That is the intercruciate interval. Normally, we call it intercruciate. You get a ACL and PCL, and you have fat between the inner So just deprive it over the reason. Once you remove the septum, your posterior medial and posterior lateral corners are just sim a single space. That septum is dividing your posterior lateral and posterior medial cord. I am very a strong believer of this remnant preservation. Yeah, I have also shifted in the last five years. So for ACL, it's very easy. For PCL, at the time of passing of the graft, it's very difficult when yes. you keep preserving the fiber of PCL. I am yes. struggling with, even struggling with this whenever I used to preserve the PCL. I have habit of preserving the ACL. So nowadays it's similar with the PCL. But it almost took 10 to 15 minutes extra for the passing of the graft from the tibia to the femur whenever I used to preserve the PCL. You should have Ratnes with you for pulling the graph. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Many uh, times this uh, he won't get broke while yes, pulling. Yes, it. yes, yes. Okay. For the benefit of the uh, beginners uh, regarding positioning of the patient, Dr. Rakesh Chaudhary uh, was giving a presentation. Uh, what are the usual uh, common positions of the limb while doing knee arthroscopy? Do you prefer a knee uh, leg hanging position or leg on the table or side hanging position or front hanging position? What uh, positions do you prefer? Uh, I have been trained in hang, uh, leg hanging position. So I still do it. But if it is a simple diagnostic or a meniscectomy, I go for a, a simple table. But once I go into ACL or PCL, I go back to my leg hanging position. Uh, to do my, I know ACL, PCL can be done there, but since I am trained in the leg hanging position, I prefer uh, to do. But if it is simple meniscus, uh, say lateral meniscus, becomes easier on a plane table where you can easily put it in a figure of four position and you do not handling it. Otherwise, if you leg hanging, if you put in a figure of four position, somebody is hanging it, uh, holding it. But if it is in a plane table, so basically both position are equally good. You have to be trained in somebody. Whatever your boss does is the best thing to do. Okay. And follow it, and you will be master of that craft. Do you take any care of the contralateral limb in the leg hanging position, or you leave it as such? Uh, the, uh, there is uh, enough of support uh, behind the uh, thigh, uh, enough of a cotton ball basically there, or the what you call jelly thing behind the leg, so that there is not a pressure there. A uh, lot of pressure there. Otherwise, uh, normally, uh, there is not too much a big problem. So, so there is just a support a bolster there, some kind of bolster so that there is not a, when you are hanging, you, it's not on the metal part of the uh, table where it hangs and the pressure is there on the uh, artery or vascular stuff. Otherwise, it shouldn't be any problem. It doesn't cause any problem. Anyone of you have uh, faced the problem of neurological deficits due to uh, this arthroscopic leg hanging position. Any of our colleagues? The leg angle, I usually do side of the bed, not in front, until unless I am not doing the posterior part work. Whenever I used to do posterior part work, like posteromedial, posterolateral, portal, both, yes. then I used to make this uh, 
hanging of the leg in front of the table with another limb over the revolving stool so that they get abducted and over the revolving stool so that that get rested otherwise all the other all the things i used to do by leg hanging to the side of the table not in front and i never that is that is you know never happen with me any neurological injury because of leg hanging in orthoscopy never seen at uh, sports injury center also and never seen at paraso yes 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 so leg hanging by the side of the table is the one benefit is that the other limb is properly rested on the table so not mm-hmm. much to uh, care about the uh, contralateral limb and regarding the posts or the leg holders what any one of you have faced any complications after using leg holders or thigh holders i have not used it since uh, now but i think if you use leg holders for prolonged time there is chances of just pressure over the your medial aspect of thigh and uh, someone has reported of uh, cpn palsy also if you are uh, using a leg holder but i think what arvin told that is very true if you are dealing with a isolated anterior compartment meniscus or acl reconstruction you can do with a side table uh, handing but you need a space when you are doing pcl so you need a space because you have to put your switching rod so at that time i think uh, leg hand position is more important more important with contralateral leg at least abducted for 60 to 70 degree in outward direction yeah. good Uh, leg hold leg holder was used a long time back i have used almost yeah, 10 yeah. years ago now now no years, years. basically uh, at that it bit difficult no, no at that time that was uh, the method to do uh, yes, you yes, were yes. easy to get the valgus and varus and you were using a lot of valgus and varus yeah. forces at that time uh, and it, really it was not uh, evolved but uh, at that time also acl was done in a 90 degree position we used to do acl at 90 degree uh, flexion now we do at 120 uh, 30 140 degree so has changed now using of uh, leg holder and whenever i use as far as i remember i used to put the tunique and then leg holder on to that so it is not a separately holding the leg by itself so there is a tunique and then is the rubber uh, thing on that and then the leg holder comes in so there is a three layers in between the skin and the leg holder metal part so there is hardly any chance okay. but not mm-hmm. used for last year okay now regarding the meniscus dr rajiv had given a very good presentation uh, what are the intra operative order criteria to suggest that a torn meniscus is a stable a torn tear or an unstable tear intra operative criteria first and most important is age If you are dealing with a degenerative tear in a 45 year or 50 year male, I think meniscus repair is not an option for me. Second is degenerative tear. If you are dealing with an old tear, I think meniscectomy is first option. For me. Third option is location of the tear. If you are dealing a tear in a pure white white zone with a friable tissue, I think meniscectomy is first option for me. For meniscus repair, young patient. robust meniscus with we have she yes the meniscus is right? quite good it's and it's a red red or red white zone i think those are the ideal candidate for meniscus repair and root repair so age uh, duration of injury and type uh, and uh, location of injury these are the three important point which will decide whether you will go for a meniscal balancing meniscectomy or meniscus repair at the same and time you should see the knee knee angles means knee should be perfectly not in varus or valgus position because once you repair a um, knee a meniscus in varus knee it, will, it is going to fail so you also and also raji one important thing is that if the it is a bucket held it should be reducible if yes, it is non reducible if you push it there and force uh, uh, repair there it is bound to go down the so, drain <laughs> if it is not reducible i think those are not the ideal meniscus for uh, it should not for repair should, you will even burn, if you, it is uh, robust, you will burn your finger big, by putting anchors there big thick meniscus there not reducible don't go for fighting with it and putting a uh, anchor in uh, so for me the thumb rule is that i should see the sharp end if you see the medial end has become rounded up it means it's a old tear because most of the patient will not give you exact date of injury that uh, the thing you put your scope aside you see a thick round meniscus there is no sharp border go for meniscectomy do not go for repair arvind what is your opinion yeah, that is called as kind of velis yeah kind of velis meniscus yes 
synovialized torn meniscus. So that synovialized torn meniscus itself says the vascularity is lost and this part is not living. So repairing such type of meniscus is not very good idea. And also at the end repairing, there is a lot of technique is there, a lot of suture anchor is there. But at the end, even after putting a lot of anchor, you have to see how much strong your knot is. That is very important and how close your margins are. Because the synovial fluid that is having its nature against the healing of the meniscus. So always try to maintain the margin convergence as much as possible and your knot should be very strong. So even though I use the all inside uh, this suture anchor, everything is good. At the end, I used to place that circumferential stitch around the meniscus. That is my habit from very early time, almost for six, seven years, I'm putting this circumferential stitch. I have seen this, this circumferential stitch uh, in Germany and I, that is my habit. That is very strong, uh, this uh, stitch. Only uh, demerit with this stitch, many a times this knot comes towards the joints. It's not toward the capsule. So if you put that knot toward the capsule, then it's very important and very good knot, knotting technique, suturing of the meniscus. This gives you very good, uh, this belief that this meniscus is going to heal. This knot is just like putting a knot over the sutured skin, same thing. So that, uh, that thing should be keep in mind, whatever you are doing, whether it's all inside, inside out, outside in, always your knotting technique should be as strong so that your margin of meniscus should be as close to as possible. Thank you. So, any more questions, Ravi? Uh, I, want, uh, I want to have uh, a question. What are the reasons? Unmute, Ravi, unmute. Ravi, unmute. Yeah, tell. Uh, I have a question for uh, Rajiv Raman, sir. Yes, Ravi. Uh, sir, you spoke about the microfracture technique. So uh, I want to know like how different is the technique for a chronic lesion, a chronic cartilage lesion, a chondral defect as compared to an acute lesion? See, most of the time we don't do it for the degenerative knee. Suppose if you put your scope inside, you have done meniscectomy, you see the degenerative cartilage is there. It's the arthritic knee. So microfracture will not work. Uh, very good. The ideal case is a traumatic chondral loss of bone. bone. Patient has a history of trauma. He has a traumatic loss. You have a robust subchondral bone. Then in those cases, I think traumatic cases, if you go for microfracture, you will have a significant healing uh, by fibrous cartilage over this raw area. Sir, how different is uh, this microfracture from the nanofracture? Nanofracture? See, normally, if you, you, can, you can use your all or you can use your, your micro drill for. Uh, uh, so, nano fracture has been described for uh, osteonecrosis. Nowadays, we are seeing lots of osteonecrosis, which we call is song, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the medial or lateral femoral condyle. So, here you want to go beyond that uh, osteonecrotic area. So, you use a thin K wire or you use a thin drill bit to go all those areas. But this osteochondral defect, you have a healthy condyle. When you have done an MRI, you see there's a healthy condyle. So if you have a healthy condyle, I think six, five to six millimeter depth of the puncture of the bone is good enough. So I still prefer microfracture over the uh, nanofracture, nano drilling for microfracture defect. I don't know opinion of the other member, Rakesh Chaudhary sir or Arvin or uh, uh, Dr. Manish. How uh, do you Rabi, see, uh, the concept of nanofracture comes because of failure of the microfracture. Mm. Usually, practice of doing microfracture with all, and that all is tip is thin, but the base is very thick. Usually, even more than three millimeter, or sometimes it's four millimeter. So, this four millimeter, uh, starting with one millimeter and four millimeter type of base, when it pierces the bone. This, this crushes the bone surroundings. At the same time, the subchondral bone is also get geopard when it is too deep. As boss has said, five, six millimeter is good enough. If you go more deeper, then the chances of injury to subchondral bone is very high. And the micro fracture success fail because of failure of your subchondral bone. If your subchondral bone is fine, 
then the success of this micro fracture is more than five year, maybe 10 year or something like that. Those who have failed with micro fracture have seen that, that there was injury to the subcondyl bone. So prevention of this subcondyl bone injury with that thick all, the nano fracture concept come that comes with either 1 mm or 1.5 mm. Yeah, At the same that. time with more deeper piercing of this subcondyl bone so that you comes to the marrow area. Marrow area is usually around 7-8 millimeter down to the bone from the cartilage part. So this 7-8 millimeter only you can do with nano fracture all, not with the micro fracture all. And at the same time, there is no injury to the subcondyl bone and the better healing with this nano, nano fracture. So nowadays there is concept of shifting of doing this um, nano fracture instead of micro fracture. But again, many concept is there, the concept of micro fracture healing of this hyaline cartilage that you make a, uh, a stable wall that uh, Rajiv was very beautiful demonstrated in the video. So that your, this cup get filled with the blood that Rajiv boss I check at the end of surgery and it get filled all over that defect. So that you can create with single hole also. No need to make lot of puncture like micro fracture or nano fracture. Just place a single hole in that creator and you will have, you will have lot of blood through that and that get contained. So in that case, your subcondyl bone will not get damaged. So there is a couple of literature over that doing this micro fracture or nano fracture thing with single hole technique only. So that concept of nano fracture comes from there. But if you see the literature at the end, micro fracture, nano fracture, almost have equal result at the end of five years. Uh, sir, I have one more question. Like uh, when we use a shaver blade, are there three different modes? We have oscillating mode, clockwise, anti-clockwise. So what are the indication for this oscillating and clockwise? Like when we should use this oscillating mode and when we use uh, this clockwise? So oscillating mode, mode we all know doing the synovectomy and all this. The forward and reverse wise, when you put this bar. Okay, so for the putting the bar in the saber, you have to doing the bar either subacromial space or femur condyle on the, this uh, for the ACL or PCL part. So then this is either forward or reverse back. And for what the saber, yeah. What yes, is it, Ravi? Yeah. What is Ravi? If you are dealing with a soft tissue, meniscus, synovium, yeah. or uh, ligaments, use in oscillating mode because you want to cut the soft tissue. If you want to deal with bone, I think oscillating mode is not work. You have to go with a continuous mode. That is either forward or reverse. All right. And for that is your uh, uh, we use a bar. Normally, you can use your saver as a bar also in continuous mode. So nowadays. In most of the system, you see, if you don't have birth, because most of these young arthroscopy surgeons, you can't purchase everything at that time. So you can use your saver as a birth in continuous mode when you want to debride the bone. You have osteophytes there. Sometimes you are dealing with ACL avalanche, you have to debride the character. So whenever you have to debride a hard thing, use it in a continuous mode. Soft thing, yeah, you have to debride, use it in the oxidating mode. Okay. Sir, I have a last question with Arvind, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, of late I have used uh, a local infiltration uh, at the side, at the portal, at the portal and intraarticular, uh, just uh, prior to 20k release uh, at the end of the surgery. So, do you have that experience? Like, is it advisable? Because I have seen uh, in two patients that they they were having this pain postoperatively when I used a local infiltration at the portal site or into the joint. Local infiltration portal site site is fine. I am not aware of intra-articular injection of local anesthesia. Uh, I used to put uh, the tranexamic acid intra-articular and antibiotic also at the end of surgery when I am doing the ligament surgery, any of this. And uh, with, uh, any synovectomy type of thing, then intra-articular tranexa and intra-articular antibiotics at the same time. But I don't use intra-articular any analgesic inside the knee. Though portal side, it's advisable. You can place definitely. There is uh, less uh, pain in post op period. Uh, uh, Rajiv boss and Rakesh boss also uh, can give this uh, opinion also. You muted Rakesh boss. You are muted. 
Unmute yourself, yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, basically, in the yester years, yes, uh, we were using a intra-articular antibiotic. Now, but we once we are dealing with most of the ligament surgery, we put it into the vancomycin or, and it absorbs that much of vancomycin. It is, gives enough of uh, uh, release, gradual release into the joint that uh, you don't need any intra-articular antibiotics nowadays. Uh, in osteoarthritis, many of times we do put uh, steroids. Uh, we are not doing it, but uh, just uh, if there is a mechanical features with uh, uh, osteoarthritis, uh, loose body, uh, torn meniscus, which is uh, catching in. Then uh, once you have taken off and removed the loose body, you know this patient is having pain. You give an intra-articular after you have drained it completely, closed it. That local anesthetic is high, I haven't used because we do give uh, IM uh, injection post-operatively. The spinal already takes it through another four or five hours. And then after that, uh, one injection uh, IM would be good enough to... Uh, Next day, the patient are normally happy with it. Not that so, much of injury. So do you routinely, routinely use tranexamic acid for all the... Uh, I don't. I don't. Oh. I don't. So arthroscopy, you don't say it, I think. Don't get it. Tranexamic acid down there. Intra-articular tranexamic, you can use to prevent the post-operative hematoma. Initially, I have almost in 30% of cases of hematoma formation. Post-ACL, PCL, I don't know the region behind it. But once I start putting this intra-articular tenemic acid at the end of surgery, that comes to almost 10%. Still, I need to spread the knee after ACL or PCL reconstruction. But it's it, one in 10 cases. Hematoma is more common when you go for synovectomy. What happens? Uh, after synovectomy, when you remove the tunicate, you have inflammation, uh, swelling inside the joint. So for bet best thing is that I usually, after synovectomy, whether I am dealing with a rheumatoid knee or a villonevar synovitis or a tubercular knee, I put a drain for 24 hours. That is the best way you take all the blood out. Or you can use a tranexamic acid also. Rajiv, yes. was, you, you was just uh, said that I don't use RF. But if you are as uh, RF in certain knee, it is being used. So you can use it after synovectomy, some RF, you close those bleeding points. Then I think that you would be happy yes, enough. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So use RF after uh, synovectomy. Uh, certain area in the posterior, uh, medial and posterior lateral corner RF is uh, because in the most PCL surgeries, you use it. Yes. And it's not that you don't. If you are very near to articular car cartilage, avoid it. But... Uh, uh, yes, yes. Shoulder, RF we are using it openly. Very, now, very. We have, a, we, have a, we have a cooled RF now, so it's not a yeah. big issue. But a septic chondrolysis, if you are doing synovid, if you touch the cartilage, damage the yeah. cartilage. That, sure, that is, sure. You should be very cautious while using RF. Uh, in a certain osteochondral desiccants, I have seen people using RF uh, yes. to clear that uh, dead uh, articular uh, cartilage. I have yes. seen them even using that. Mostly in but, patella. Uh, mostly in patella. Sometimes yes. you uh, accidentally find it in Padla. Yes, sure, sure, sure. RF is, when I, sometimes we will have a lecture uh, on RF also. It's yeah. very good and a very nice device to use. Uh, not a very, it is very expensive okay, okay. with the bandage. Very nice discussion. <laughs> a very nice discussion regarding the basics of arthroscopy. Almost I think we have gone into the advanced arthroscopy. Uh, so, uh, should we continue further or we should ask our president sir to yeah. sum up? Yeah, now we invite uh, our uh, dynamic secretary, Dr. Madhusudan, to say some words about the, uh, our webinar. And uh, today's program is very successful. Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Uh, really, today's program is very successful. I would like to thank Dr. Rakesh Chaudhary, the past president and past secretary of BOA. Uh, he gave us, a, gave us a very good knowledge about the portal of the patient position, arthroscopy instruments, and Dr. Arvind Prasad Gupta, the portal entry, arthroscopic. Uh, anatomy also and arthroscopy diagnostic. And also give thanks to Dr. Rajiv Roman. Uh, he 
told us about the minister and arthroscopy ministerectomy synovectomy and how to remove the loose body loose body excision and i give thanks to uh, i would like to thanks to dr manish uh, and dr ratnesh and dr ravi who asked the very very uh, basic question that uh, for the discussion that is very uh, fruitful for us uh, i i would like to give thanks to dr samsul hoda for conducting the meeting very smoothly he is the convener of it of our association and i thanks each and every member of our i thanks each and every one of you for making today program huge success i thanks to all of you at last one sad news i like to uh, tell you uh, very sad news dr arvin kumar the professor and head of the government medical college vidya he no more he passed away today may his soul rest in peace is dukh ki ghadi mein भगवान उनके परिवार के उनके बच्चों को इस दुख को सहने की शक्ति दें लास्टली आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर प्रेसिडेंट आवर रिस्पेक्टेड प्रेसिडेंट डॉक्टर शराब सर टू स्टे टू से फ्यू वर्ड्स थैंक यू इट वाज अ ग्रेट वंडरफुल सेशन आई लर्न सो मेनी थिंग्स एंड लाइक मी मेनी ऑर्थोपेडिक सर्जन मस्ट हैव लर्न सो मेनी थिंग्स you all are great arthroscopic surgeon i feel so your concept your communication is quite impressive really it is quite impressive and i thank you all in participating participating this seminar thank you to you all thank you all speakers and panelists and thank you all thank you sir with this may thank you sir take permission to end the Like yes, yes, yes. Yes, Samsul, it's your dinner time. You are working since morning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Vikas, for joining. Yeah. Thank Vikas, sir. Thank you, boss. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Stay safe. Stay well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. We were also uh, on. Uh, Thanks to all of you. Very nice program today. Thanks to all of you, giving you, your valuable time. Dr. Raju Raman, sir. Thank you, boss. Sir from Kolkata, Dr. Rakesh ji. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Gupta, uh, Rajiv Anand is also here. Dr. Manish, yes. Dr. Vikas. Thank you, sir. Thanks to all of you making this program grand success. Thank you. We are expecting such type of pro program next time. Yeah, next time. Beautiful Saturday. program. We are expecting from Rajiv Ganjan uh, the same type of program. Huh? What of the programs? We'll finalize. We will we'll finalize the date late, later on. Yes. 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 Thank you, sir. Uh, definitely. Sir. Definitely. Thank you, sir. And just to add, sir, we were also live on IOA TV also. Uh, besides Ortho TV, wow. YouTube, and Facebook. From wow. next uh, webinar, we'll be simultaneously live on IOA TV also. Wow. And we had a thousand, sir, uh, audience, sir. Yes, sir. Good night. Uh, good night to you all. Good night to you. Thanks, good night, sir. sir.